Well, hi there and good morning and welcome to Sunday Morning Mass. Men are so smart. I'm Lou Gallagher. Corvette Ronnie. Happy Sunday, Ronnie. Oh, thank you. All rise. All right, please be seated. I was just kidding. Uh, <laughs> sorry. If you wrote. I tried to. Yeah. I, it just wasn't happening. Well, uh, you know, my, my, my mind said do it, but yeah. my body said I'm not yeah. rising. I thought I was, but yeah. it just it didn't happen. Well, on today's show, <clears throat> uh, we do a lot of, a number of different things on Sunday morning mass. Sometimes it's open to f different topics. And today we're actually going to be talking about the fan treasure. So we're glad that you're here. Thanks to Meh, one of our uh, fans of the show. Um... We received this book, and I am proud to say that not only have I read it, I've read it twice, mm -hmm. and uh, Ronnie, uh, we're going to do the handoff here at the end of this show. Oh. Not yet, no, no. I'm, you, you know what? I was trying to rush it. I was just trying, yeah. You jumped the gun on me there. Yeah, felt like now we're going to have to start the whole show over. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I'll be handing it off to Ronnie at the end, but I thought I would go ahead and give you my review of uh, vaguely of what I thought of the book um, and and let me premise this by saying that at one point during our uh, tenure here on Men Are So Smart and talking about the Fen Treasure Ronnie and, I, Ronnie and I did an episode and, and I don't recall which one it was Ronnie it's there's so many they kind of seem to blend together yes well uh, we talked about how the book The Thrill of the Chase was poorly written and had a lot of mistakes and grammatical errors uh, yeah, and punctuation. And, and you know what? We were so naive then. And I hope that you noticed that, having been a fan for some time and watched our fan episodes. Ronnie and I have, uh, well, we don't proclaim to be experts by any means. But in, in any field. Uh, right. <laughs> Jack of all trades. Least of, of which none. is this one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I'm here to tell you that I thoroughly enjoyed this book. Ronnie uh, checked in with me the first night I started reading it, and I, I guess I, I was trying to read it at work during uh, lunch and breaks and stuff. And you get stumped on a couple of the big words. I, I did, it, and I had to call I Ronnie. You, yeah. So uh, I got to page 63, and we had a funny exchange. Remember those uh, gifts that you sent me uh, with, with the speed reading? Oh, and I yes. go, No, that's... That's too fast. And then he showed me this cat that was going like this. Yeah. That's perfect. That's me right there. Okay, so, um, yeah, and, and my response to it, he said, did you enjoy it? And I said, I've enjoyed every single page so far. This is um, a really great quick read. Uh, it's in the hardback uh, version, so... It's a little hard, uh, you know, carrying it around and stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it makes for the perfect beach book, per se. You should get a backpack like the kids have. Oh, the kids, yeah, they yeah. know it all. Yeah, I should yeah. do that. So, um, I enjoyed every single page and uh, read it twice, as I said. And I don't want to influence Ronnie and, and what he thinks of the story just yet. Uh, and we'll next, uh, maybe next Sunday morning on Mass... We'll do Ronnie's take on the book. But I have to say, Ronnie, uh, of all of the words in the memoir, uh, this particular chapter, page 115, Tea with Olga, was one of my favorite, favorite parts. And uh, Forrest Fenn is many things. An archaeologist, a millionaire, a fighter pilot, the list goes on and on and on. Cancer survivor. Good point. And, and, and let me tell you this. Um, I have respect for each one of those, for lack of a better term, titles that he holds. And um, he is quite an interesting man. But in this particular chapter, he shows a little bit of emotion. Oh. And it, almost vulnerability, Ronnie. And I thought I would just... Uh, talk about this just a little bit. Um, I see you have some parts circled in crayon there. No, those are circles I was drawing. <laughs> oh, just doodling? Yeah. <laughs> just had the crayon. It was my grandson's. <laughs> I think it was burnt sienna. Oh, I, that's my favorite <laughs> color. <love> color. <laughs> All right, somewhere along the way, I learned that my cost could also show a profit. And what he's talking about is... Uh, 
running a, a gallery and uh, he felt as though at first he didn't deserve to make money on the things that he was trading or selling. Olga Swoboda, remember this chapter is called Tea with Olga. She was a good example. She lived immediately behind our business in a space that was much too small, even for one person. Her bathtub was just 36 inches long and looked crowded in her bathroom. When I offered to move her into a condo and pay all of her housing expenses forever, if she would trade me her little casita, she just smiled. She knew I wanted to expand my gallery space and declined, of course. So we laughed and we drank tea. <laughs> then one day she asked me to go to her. When I arrived, her attorney was present. The mood turned somber when she said she was dying of cancer and needed a favor. Her plan was for me to spread her ashes on top of Taos Mountain, and in exchange, she would state in her will that I could have her little rooms at their appraised value. She loved the sacred old mountain with its strong ponderosa and aspen groves that blanketed its landscape so completely. She said her father's ashes were there and she wanted to be with him again. The deal was soon struck, so we sipped black tea and nibbled on Oreos. Okay, hmm. note, Ronnie. Okay. Bring Oreos on our trip. Right. Olga was a delightful <laughs> woman with a warm and giving heart. She was also too young to be treated with such disrespect by the ungentle laws of nature, and she joked about outrunning the well bug. She had not seen the mountain from the air, so I asked her to fly the 90 miles with me to take one last look. Hmm. She was fearful of flying and said she would never untake such an outrageous adventure. I explained that no one should ever fear crashing because it's really only the last inch that counted. Right. Yeah. That brought a smile, but not one of approval. <laughs> we joked about the irony of my plane wrecking with her ashes on board as being <laughs> nature's ultimate affront. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Such good-natured repartee continued as the light in her eyes slowly dimmed. Over the weeks and months, my little gifts of flowers and bubble gum brought temporary relief, but did little to belay the relentless feeling of sadness that permeated our visits. The tea drinking rituals we always enjoyed had somehow become necessities. Although Olga's cancer was insidious and unforgiving by nature, it also allowed time for her to reflect and prepare. And, and as you know, Forrest has been there through this himself, mm -hmm. as have I. It was bright and sunny when my little plane lifted off, so she goes with him and headed north. And I looked forward to performing the promised duty. The billowing clouds seemed to frame the task ahead, and with a small window open, I enjoyed the ever-present aroma of sage and juniper. He's so descriptive, mm -hmm. but so every man kind of writer. Uh, and he talks about, early in the book, he talks about some of the uh, famous writers. J.D. Salinger was one of them. And, and he questioned why those books were so popular. Uh... My first view of the great mountain brought a shock. The top was covered with snow that I should have known would remain most of the summer. And we've talked about... Your window of opportunity. It's not very, very uh, long. Yep. Uh, it looked cold and foreboding as I circled, trying to decide what Ogle really wanted. She said, on top of Taos Mountain, that desire seemed unlikely under the circumstances and somewhat aloof from any sober voice of reason. The bitterness of cold remains long after the sweetness of a sentimental moment is forgotten. Surely her father was not way up on top. I know Olga's spirit was pleased when her white bone fragments flittered through the small window and softly floated down to a place where the charisma and mountain laurels were blooming and chipmunks scurried all year round. When my plane and I turned south for home, I felt a serene sense of warmth and satisfaction. Olga was at peace at last, and I suspected she may be having green tea with her father. Time had taken them apart, but it eventually brought them back together. I'm telling you, I, look, I got goosebumps here. Look, am I, am I kidding? No, you're not, yeah. Uh, this man is so wonderful in nature, and what I mean is his is, is makeup. He, um, he's a giver, Ronnie, and he likes the simple things in life. And um, that story, it, it, it's just an example of how the rest of the book goes for you. Each story, one better than the other.
Well, and I'll tell you that no, no fewer than probably before we got the book, I got probably no fewer than four emails, people quoting me different parts of that particular uh, chapter, chapter, feeling like it was very important to the solve. Uh, well, okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, yes, to some in terms of their solve. I will tell you this, Ronnie, in terms of the most amount of clues in a picture, it's this one I'm showing here, and this is an airplane, and those are bombs. And I want you to make, draw your attention right over here. As you can see, uh -oh. those are, what do you call those, gullets, I think, or something? Um, they're they're uh, weaponry. And they're hankered down in some kind of a, what would you call it? Or a foxhole. Uh, yeah, a foxhole. Yeah, yeah. Notice that there is a square right here under this tree. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so I, I find a lot of hints in a lot of the pictures, including the one with him with the axe standing on the tree stump, surrounded by chopped down tree stumps. And um, I guess I can say it right now, Ron. I am in touch with a guy who, and I know what you're saying. You've said this before, Lou. No, I haven't. What I have coming up is a story of where the treasure is. Yep. And I have, uh, in fact, this morning, I was in contact with a gentleman who is, well, I'm not even going to tell you what state he's in, but he's been there for about the last six days in the exact spot, I mean, almost down to a 10-foot square area, and he's been digging. And I want to talk about that. What do we hear all the time about the treasure? It well, isn't buried? Right. Yeah, well, it's not... He has said it's not in a bear cave or some other type of cave. But there's lots of other types of caves. Uh, where or crevices. Or as crevices, yeah. Okay. Where it could be, have something over the top of it. Uh, okay, there we go. Now, this treasure has been hidden for 10 or 11 years, correct? Right. And it's out of doors. It's not in any sort of a man made uh, building or anything. No. Nope. Um, I believe that this treasure chest is wedged in a little crevasse between some rocks. And I believe in such a way that it, it's like this, perpendicular chest here. And if you can imagine how much the earth changes based on dirt and rock falling and wind and erosion and water and rain. If you can imagine how much dirt has built up over the course of 11 years, it's probably covering this treasure. So it may not be, you know, does, Fer does Forrest know that? Chances are no, Ron. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, I, I don't think there's any reason for him to go back there f forever. Uh, it's it's eternally embedded in his mind, and it's a great memory. Um, but he's not going back there. As we've said, somebody would be following him. Yeah, not a good idea. I mean, just wouldn't be that difficult to set up a little game camera somewhere outside his property, and every time somebody leaves, you get a little notification on your iPhone, and... I don't know. Let's address that. The story about somebody being within 200 feet of the treasure and somebody being 500. 500 really means nothing to me, but here's what here's what I've discovered in the last few days. Based on the information that Forrest has been provided. And there's a television show and I was told about it earlier this morning. It's about this guy who goes out and tries to track down treasures. Um, damn it, I wish I could remember the name of it. I'll put it up here on the screen. And um, 
the picture that he took and showed on television of where he was looking, it is believed that Forrest himself, hi Forrest, say hi to Forrest, Ronnie, because you hey, know Forrest. he said he watches our show. Yes. And I'll just send him this link. Yes. Uh, he says that they, or it said that he believes they were within 200 feet, but you know what? It's not distance, it's vertical. Oh. Oh. All right. The treasure is up a little higher than, and there's a waterfall nearby, if what I'm being told is correct, which is about 100 feet high. Now, I know that sounds like, well, how could Forrest climb that high? There is a way to do it. I am in touch with a guy who is at that location right now. Mm. Um, and I'm going to give you the solve. I'm going to bring the solve to you in the next couple of weeks. Wow. And Well, uh, and because the searcher has told you he's, he's tossing the hat, right? He's mm -hmm. done. Yes, exactly. He's a single dad uh, raising a young daughter. He's 44 years old. He has a daughter who's 17 and a single dad, so he's still supporting her. And um, he's probably spent close to well, somewhere between five and $7,000 in his searching. Um, and it's kind of funny because he's a relatively new searcher. And ah, ah, don't balk. Right. Don't balk at that. You know what? Forrest has just recently said that if you're going to be going and looking for this treasure, bring fresh eyes. And that's essentially what we've been saying, too. Right. You know, uh, and this searcher says that he found this location by doing exactly what Forrest Fan told him to do, which is stay in the box. Yeah. Well, and I had a, I had a solve sent to me this week, uh, and this person wants somebody to go check right where they believe it is. I said, that's not happening. And the, it's because searchers are doing their own research and then they go out and they look in that area. Now, best case scenario, you would have a researcher working with a searcher. And maybe would be, it would be somebody relatively new that's never been boots on the ground that can go through and analyze elevations uh, and all the rest of the clues that have been kind of leaked out there, Easter egged out there, and then hand them off to people and have them go out and search. I don't think that one person researching and searching, that's a tough, that's tough. Um, yeah, and, and I will tell you another thing too, it's not gonna help to have somebody there researching with you, here's why. There's no Wi-Fi. No. <laughs> there, no. In fact, this gentleman that I'm speaking with, I'm not going to mention his name, and, and as you can see, he is continuing to send me emails right. as we speak. Yep. From there, what he had to do was leave the location and get into a spot in town where he'd have Wi-Fi in order to be able to, A, have the phone conversation with me today, and B, get these emails off to me so mm -hmm. I can get to work on that episode. Uh, Ronnie, um, I think that I'm ready to hand the book off to you. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I feel like I need a specially prepared, here's a, here's okay. a $30 microfiber towel. Uh-huh. I'm going to. Oh, so it doesn't get dirty? Yeah. Just... Okay, Ronnie, here we go. This is the ceremonial <laughs> handing off of the thrill of the chase. <laughs> There you go. You have it. I have the book. I feel kind of like Lion King, where I'm holding up the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Holding up the baby lion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ronnie, we've seen the book. All right, so Ronnie, it'll probably take him about three weeks. <laughs> but he will get through it. Yes. And um, we'll have his review in an upcoming episode very, very soon. Yep. Uh, I'm, I might say that... Uh, Ronnie's got the next two weekends 
really slammed. And yeah. um, I told him he doesn't have enough men or so smart vacation hours, <laughs> but he insists <clears throat> on taking time off. So I'm calling off sick. I, no. You hear that cough? No, nah, that wasn't nothing. I just coughed. No, nah, I wouldn't that crap. That sounds pretty serious. I wouldn't crap. I, I, no. have, I have TB, probably. No, you don't. I would imagine. Ronnie, you're fine. I don't know. I know you're a young strapping dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> okay. I was in the smoky atmosphere last oh, night. Oh, that's right. You were at a concert. We were at a concert. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so. It wasn't cigarette smoke either. Uh, you know, I even forgot to mention throughout this, we are live with you this morning, and we are taking your comments as you're watching this. That's We're right. watching. Yeah. This episode comes up at 7 o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. and Ronnie and I start watching it from our respective homes and uh, reviewing it and watching for your comments, and we'd love to have them. We will reply. It's about as close to live as technology allows us to do right now. Yeah, and, and as this show ends, we're going to continue to stay with you for a couple of hours. Uh, I will be editing, and uh, Ronnie will be doing various honeydews around the house, yes. I imagine, right? Yep. So, uh, thank you very much for watching today. Yeah. Thanks again to Matt for sending us that book. Dude, you stepped up big time. And you know, Matt, uh, if I might say, I owe it to you because it really changed the way that I look at things. And I have a feeling that I will read it again uh, more than twice. Uh, and as I said, I, I can't wait to bring you this episode of this solve. Please watch every episode. You never know when this is going to be coming up. And uh, we will tell the story of this solve. And I think you're just going to, you're going to go like this. Yeah. Or they could do one of these, like commence eye roll sequence in three, two, one. Right. Could happen. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. We do what we want. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. We hope you enjoyed the show today. Yeah, I sure did. I did too. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got a little story time in. Yeah. It's uh, that was good. Uncle Lou's story time. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have uh, Uncle Corvette's story time on an upcoming episode. You know what maybe we could do is just read the book one chapter at a time. Yeah, that's an idea. Yeah, and, and save people from buying the book. Right, so much for show yeah. prep too, right? Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. No, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing that. Uh, send us your emails. My email address you've seen coming across the screen along with Ronnie's. Uh, we're here for you virtually 24-7. We enjoy your comments. Man, we enjoy your comments. Yeah. And we love to reply to them and uh, keep them coming. Another email just came in. Yes. Uh, oh, also wanted to mention that I think today will probably be the day that we go over 500 subscribers. And I know that doesn't sound like a lot to you folks, but to us, it means the world. It's a bit of a milestone for, for us. For the longest time, we had, what, 30? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we thought about not doing this anymore. But uh, here we are. So, all right, R Ronnie, uh, put your beer down. I'm Lou Gallagher. Or Ronnie. Uh, and I uh, will see you on the next episode of Men Are So Smart. Bye-bye.